We are in a period of unprecedented change for everyone in the social care sector. It's all about improving the quality of care for the most vulnerable people in our society. As managers, we all have questions about what these changes mean for our organisation or service, for our clients and for our staff. Here at ACC, we've been busy talking to some of the people driving these changes in order to bring you some of the background and the latest news on introduction of the care certificate. We all know there's a lot of change coming, but are you ready? Welcome to ACC, I'm Sue Ascot and it's great to have you with us for this special live event today. I'm joined by Sharon Allen, Chief Executive of Skills for Care. Great to have you with us. Delighted to be here, Sue, and looking forward to sharing information about the care certificate. That's great, thank you. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what we'll be covering today. Firstly, we'll have a look at the background to the introduction of the care certificate, because this has its origins with the introduction of the Care Act. So we will talk a little bit about that before we move on to look in detail at the care certificate. Then Sharon will give us an update on the timeline for the launch and the transition arrangements, together with some of the information on the content of the care certificate. She'll also talk about the role of the manager as the assessor in the completion of the care certificate. Then we'll open up the phone lines and the text lines and it's over to you to ask your questions directly to Sharon here in the studio. Once you've watched the programme, give us a call on 0208 635 0030. That number again is 0208 635 0030. Or text your question in on 07807 312453. Again, the text number is 07807 312453. Now this is a hot topic, so get ready to ask your questions as soon as we open up the lines later in the programme. But first, let's have a look at some of the background behind the story of how we've arrived at the introduction of the care certificate. The Francis Inquiry report was published in February 2013. It examined the causes of the failings in care at Mid Staffordshire NHS Foundation Trust between 2005 and 2009. This report was a catalyst for change in the health and social care sector at a time when change and reform was also being driven by the government through the implementation of the Care Bill, which then became the Care Act in 2014. Care and Support Minister Norman Lamb talked about the reforms to the social care system. The Care Act represents the most significant reform of care and support in more than 60 years putting people and their carers in control of their care and support. And, crucially, the Act delivers key elements of the government's response to the Francis Inquiry into the awful events at Mid Staffordshire Hospital, increasing transparency and openness, and helping drive up the quality of care across the system. Well, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services seeks to shape and inform and influence government policy. So we have been joint sponsors of the imp implementation of the CARE Act. I think that the four main cornerstones of the CARE Act are having fantastic advice and information, not just a menu or a list of services that people can opt into, but good advice and information helps people to understand the circumstances in which they find themselves. And the second thing is fantastic recovery, rehabilitation, reablement services. This is designed to keep people as independent as possible. The third thing is person-centred, coordinated care. The fourth pillar is to develop what we call community capacity. So this is encouraging the whole society um, to be as sensitive to the needs of people with disabilities and long-term illnesses as possible. So we have five and a half million carers in this country and the use of personal budgets and the introduction of services for carers could have a profound impact on people's lives and is an essential element of the CARE Act. Integration of health and social care is a key driver of change through the CARE Act. The biggest benefit uh, around integration is to make sure that the services that people need to receive are, are joined up so that people 
don't have to fall down between the gaps between different organisations and different services. So I think that's really what we mean by integration, integration around our needs. We spoke to Clinton Farkerson, co-chair of Think Local Act Personal, and he gave us his thoughts on the CARE Act. Integration and cooperation and partnerships are not new ideas. That's one of the big challenges for the CARE Act, but it also provides opportunity for social care services to integrate health and social care to better serve people and save money at the same time. But the cultural divide between health and social care often get in the way of those partnerships. So I hope the CARE Act will blur the distinction between health and social care. Following the Francis Inquiry and alongside the development of the CARE Act, Secretary of State Jeremy Hunt asked Camilla Cavendish to review and make recommendations on the recruitment, learning and development, management and support of both health care assistants and social care support workers. The Cavendish Review was published in July 2013 and reported that the preparation of new healthcare assistants and new social care support workers was inconsistent. One of the recommendations was the development of a new care certificate for all those new to health and social care support roles. So, there were a number of drivers for change, but what does this mean for you as managers of a service? There are many challenges and many rewards of working in social care. In my 36 years of working in social care, there have been some challenging moments, but there have been some fantastic moments where I've seen the way in which social care has transformed people's lives. And I think the induction programme and the uh, certificate can make a huge contribution in helping people to think through those issues at an early stage in their career. Andrea Sutcliffe is Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care at the Care Quality Commission. She told us what inspectors are looking at when they go out and visit a service provider. So when our inspectors go out to visit and inspect services, they will be asking five key questions, and we know that those are the questions that matter to people who are using services. So they will be asking, is the service safe? Is it caring? You know, are people treated with dignity and respect? Is it effective? You know, does it do what we need it to be doing? Is it responsive to people's needs and particularly responsive to needs as they're changing? For example, as somebody's condition progresses or the end of life comes near. And very importantly, we will also be asking, is the service well led? So that we can see um, what the culture is like, um, how the leadership and the management um, are supporting their staff, whether staff are encouraged to raise concerns and if those concerns are acted upon, and how well the service works with the residents or the people using the service and indeed their relatives. And we know, for example, that the number of older people in this country over the age of 85 is due to due to double over the next two decades. It is fantastic that we're all living longer and can enjoy uh, healthy lives in, in the main. And of course we know that social care helps people live good lives with whatever disability or illness they have. I was at an event about the CARE Act last year with members of the National Co-Production Advisory Group and I overheard this comment from one of our members that sums up how the CARE Act will put people who use services in control. The fellow delegate said, I know how the system is supposed to work, but I was powerless to influence mum's care. Nothing was joined up with each part of the system only interested in their part of the problem. With the goal of integration, I think the CARE Act will help to address issues like this. Some of the change has been driven by the regulator, the Care Quality Commission, which has itself gone through a period of significant change over the past few years. But why is the Care Act important from a regulator's perspective? What I'd really like people to think about around the Care Act is that it matters to them. You know, it is, it is a piece of legislation and that's really important and it says some great things. But actually, if we don't use it, if we don't kind of take that central tenet of um, the well-being of people using services to, you know, to heart in what we do day in and day out, then it's just a piece of paper. 
So actually what we need to be doing is thinking about how can we translate those really powerful words into meaningful action on a day-to-day -day basis. So all of the change is driving towards the improvement of quality in the adult social care sector. And make no mistake, all of the changes are here to stay. And all will directly impact on you as employers, business owners and managers. We've looked at the origins of the Care Act, why it's important for the social care sector, and we've heard the views of key people in our sector. Now let's turn our attention to the care certificate itself and what this will mean for you and your staff. What also makes for a good social care service is making sure that we not only train staff appropriately, but they are supported and want to continue to work in the home or that's the sector in which they're work working at the time. Training and development helps people to feel confident in their role, to feel, to feel valued, and that helps with recruitment and retention. And we know that in social care there's a 32% turnover vacancy level, turnover level in terms of nursing care, and a 25% turnover of care staff. That's not a good basis for good care. So actually making sure that people are properly trained and are properly valued will make sure that people are, want to remain in the sector, want to remain in that working environment and give a great service. I think one of the really important things that's um, coming in um, is the care certificate and as, think, and as making sure that that is uh, providing a really solid basis um, for people who are working in health and social care. And one of the really important things about that, I think, is that it's actually saying, you know, it's a tough job. You know, these are difficult things that people have got to do and we, you know, we need people who are really skilled um, and trained and supported to do that. So I think that this is actually giving us a really good basis to value what our care staff are doing and that is so important um, to attract really good staff and to retain them but also to support them in their own career development. The care certificate offers a way of recognising the talent in care making the most of the care workforce that is strong, capable and proud and it's a way of professionalising social care and putting workers on a more equal footing with the health sector. The care certificate is a really important um, step along the path of making sure that the people who are working in adult social care are capable and confident of delivering the high quality, safe, compassionate care that we all want to see. So I think it's a really important um, focus for us um, in, in adult social care, but we shouldn't see it as the be all and end all. Um, it needs to be a foundation upon which further training and development is, is, is built. So one of the things that our inspectors will be looking at is, does the service have sufficient, well-trained staff who can provide the care that's required? So we would be wanting to make sure that um, the induction training and the ongoing training doesn't just happen in the first few weeks, um, that that training is focused on delivering uh, to the needs of the people who are using the service. So for example, if um, you're working with people who are living with dementia, how well do the staff know about the Mental Capacity Act and the deprivation of liberty safeguards? Making sure that they've had that training, but that they truly understand it and then they can apply it in their practice. So we'll be looking at evidence that it's happened, but we will also be looking at evidence that it's been embedded and it's being acted upon. Well, training is absolutely crucial because the quality of the experience, the thing that makes the most difference is training because that can influence the care and support that people receive tomorrow. Yeah. There is a direct relationship between that. So investment in training and development as, as individual um, carers or uh, people working in social care is absolutely crucial. So I think um, training and development is absolutely fundamental to developing a good social care system in the 21st century. 
Well, one of the things that I would say is that we think managers are really, really important in adult social care. So managers are really important in terms of uh, making sure that they know what's going on, and what's going on with the residents in the service or the people who are using the service, but also what's going on with their staff. And part of that is being clear that they know how competent and confident their staff are in actually delivering the care that's required. So a good service for me is when uh, we walk in and we have a chat with the manager and he or she knows absolutely what the needs of their staff are in terms of their training, um, that she can give um, or he can give examples um, of uh, what training has been provided, what impact that has had um, and how well people are actually delivering care as a consequence. And that they're also able to identify how they're assessing what um, staff are doing so that they can pick up on where there are continuing training needs and then make sure that there are um, programmes in place to address that. Social care is a people business. It's, it's actually about what we do. It's that application of the technical and the personal, the hearts and the minds, that makes a difference in social care. And that process needs to start at the beginning of our careers. Welcome back to the studio, where I'm joined today by our guest, Sharon Allen. Hello. A reminder that we'll be taking your questions very shortly and that number is 0208 635 0030 and you can call us now at any time. That number again 0208 635 0030. Now Sharon while we're waiting um, for questions to come in yeah. could you talk a little bit about the care certificate and uh, the timeline that actually is going to be around the implementation. Yes, uh, thanks Sue. Um, I think one of the really important messages we want to get across to employers is that the care certificate is part of the whole approach to leadership, learning and development in our sector. So let's not see this in isolation. It's a very important part, but um, we need employers to think about how this aligns with their commitment through the social care commitment and um, how it feeds into the, the broader suite of, of leadership, learning and development. But the expectation is that from April, April the 1st of this year, all employers will be taking their new staff through the framework of the care certificate. Great, so the actual launch date 1st of April. Yes. Um, and from then people using the new care certificate framework. That's yes. great. And, and what about transition arrangements? Because I imagine that you can't just have a, a cut off date 1st of April. Mm. Um, how will managers, how long will managers be able to use their existing common induction standard materials yeah. um, before they need to replace those? Yeah, so I think that's absolutely right. We're not talking about a cliff edge here and we have worked with the Care Quality Commission, uh, our partners and us, um, to ensure that we have a, a sensible transition programme um, with a, a pragmatic approach and so I think what CQC are saying is they will take a proportionate approach when they go out they will expect to see that, um, new, that employers are taking their new staff from April through the care certificate. Some staff will be completing their common induction standards. It makes no sense to say, well, you have to stop that on the 31st of March and now do the care certificate. So I think as long as people can evidence that they are providing an effective induction based on the common induction standards up to the end of March and from the 1st of March moving to the uh, care certificate and can show a planned approach to making that change. That's what we're looking for. And I imagine there's going to need to be a transition period because uh, not everybody will be able to buy the new materials from 1st of April. So a proportionate approach from the regulators is, is about allowing that transition to move in over a period of time as well. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, we're not talking about fixed periods of time because some people, you know, some people have already piloted the materials yes. for us, so we'll be um, well ahead in terms of the curve. We've got uh, information and advice already up on our website and our, our partners' websites that people can look at. You can see what the framework is. There'll be more materials to come. And so we're really encouraging everybody to, to get up to speed, to find out what's already there, put your plans in place and move across into the care certificate. That's great, thank you. Um, and the new standards are out for the care certificate, which is great, from mm. the end of January. Mm. Could you give us a, a brief overview of the main differences between the content that's in the care certificate now mm. and the content that was in or is in the mm. common induction standards? Yeah. 
So for our social care employers, the care certificate should um, have a lot of very familiar content because, as you know, it's um, been heavily predicated on the common induction standards, mm -hmm. yes. but there are some notable differences. Yeah. And I think perhaps the one that um, has got most attention is the standard around provision of basic life um, support. Mm -hmm. But many of the other standards are things you would already be familiar with and you will already be ensuring that your staff are um, becoming competent and evidencing their competence and capability, for example, around providing person-centred care, um, around dignity, around good communication, around nutrition and hydration. Yeah. So it shouldn't be um, a kind of, it's not a completely new thing we're doing, it's just got some additional elements to it. Great, that's great. Well, our phone lines are really busy uh, okay. and we have a caller in already. And our first caller is Rachel from Haddon Hall. Hello, Rachel. Hi. What's your question for Sharon? Um, is the care certificate just for care staff? As in the care home, we do have domestic staff and mm -hmm. civil staff. And no. with the CIS, there's some, there doesn't seem any relevancy with their, their roles. Okay, thanks for that, Rachel. That's a, that's a really great question, actually, and that's something that we debated um, on our journey to, to um, providing the, the final care certificate. Um, and the care certificate is, the purpose of it is to ensure that all people who are providing direct care and support, whether in social care or health, can um, be signed off by their manager as, as competent against those standards. There's nothing to stop organisations using the standards that are appropriate to people in other roles. And I know that, that many um, providers don't have people working in kind of segmented roles. So because somebody um, works in the kitchen or is a domestic, they also have engagement with um, the, the people who uh, need care and support and so the principles again around for example effective communication checking out with somebody mm. do they want you to call them by their first name do they mm. want you to uh, address them in another way that's relevant whoever you yes. are in the service but to achieve the care certificate you do need to demonstrate that you have the underpinning knowledge and you can translate that into practice against all 15 standards. Okay, that's a great question. I think you have another question for us, Rachel, do you? I, I do, yes. Um, CQC will be coming in to, um, to, to monitor, you know, the, the care certificate. Mm. Now, as an organisation, we, you know, we want to know, is, will there be any competence sheets that's something that we can work with the person, sign off that they are competent yeah. or, and, and capable of doing that, that job? Yeah. Yeah, that's another great Good question, question Rachel. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, and yes, the answer is there will be. We will provide, be providing templates and workbooks. Um, so we've got the, the guidance around the framework already on our website. And if you haven't looked at that, I'd encourage you to, to do that. Um, we haven't yet finished all of the support products, but they will be there um, very shortly. Um, so I'd encourage you again to keep looking at the website mm. and also if you're not already to sign up to Skills for Care's e-news because that's the way that we keep um, everybody informed about what we're developing or you can follow me on Twitter. That's, that's some good advice. Thanks Rachel, thanks for your call. Thank and you very much. Thank you, bye. And we've got our next caller on the line who is Ellie from First Hill House. Hello Ellie. Hello there. Hello, what's your question? Right, it's kind of similar to the one that's just been asked, but my question is, what learning resources will be available for the care certificate mm. and what sort of um, paperwork, etc., will staff be required to complete? Okay, thanks Ellie. Um, so as I was just saying to Rachel, um, we are developing templates, we are developing workbooks, so um, those of you that are already using the common induction standards will be familiar with the products that we have available. Yeah. We will have um, similar support materials available for you that you can work with your staff so that they can capture their learning and you can assess it and you can have that evidence then to share with the inspector, with the commissioner and perhaps more importantly with the people that you're providing care and support to and, and their, their family carers. Right, that's lovely. Thanks very much for your okay. call. Thanks Thank Ellie. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. And, and following on from that, I guess um, a question that, that, that could follow that quite nicely is can employers use their own learning materials if they've got them 
They don't need to be bound by the ones that are provided? Of course not. Um, if, if employers have their own materials, if they've got their own in-house learning and development uh, team and they want to um, produce their own materials mm. then they are absolutely at liberty to do that. What we're asking them to do is to ensure that those materials um, address all of the standards yes. that we've developed with employers yes. for the care certificate and right. that's what the inspector will be looking yeah. at. Yes. Their expectation is whatever it is you use that we can all be assured it actually meets those standards. Okay. And, and leading on from that, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role of the manager as the assessor mm. of competence in the care certificate. Mm. Yes, um, I mean the role of the manager, as we all know, is absolutely pivotal to the provision of good quality care. Uh, I used to be chief executive of a, a relatively large um, voluntary sector provider and I know from personal experience just how pivotal those managers absolutely. are. And um, you know, we want to say thank you actually to all those managers out there doing a great job day in, day out. Um, but the role of the manager is really to assure themselves that every member of their team knows what they need to do and can demonstrate their ability to do that to, to, the, to the highest standard to ensure that good quality care is provided. So I know we've, we've already had some calls earlier mm. um, and we've had calls, you know, we get lots of calls to our um, helpline in Skills for Care. Does the manager have to have a specific qualification? No, mm. Mm. no they don't. Um, what the manager needs to do is to be able to assure themselves and assure the others who have a legitimate interest in understanding this that they have the, um, the uh, occupational competence to assess their staff as, as them being occupationally competent to be able to work uh, without line of direct supervision. That's great, thank you. And we've got a text question okay. coming in now. So um, this is from uh, Helen. Uh, from Churchfell Housing Association, when will the workbooks be available? <laughs> yeah, this is the question people need, I guess. Yes, okay, Helen. Um, it's a good question, and I'm really sorry I can't give you quite such a definitive answer on that one as I've been able to give on, on other questions, but it will certainly be um, before the end of March when um, the care certificate, you know, we'll be ready for the care certificate to go live in April. We are working on them. This is um, a joint piece of work with Health Education England and Skills for Health. One of the great things about it, I think, is that for the first time ever, we have a common approach to induction across social care and health. But I'm sure, as everybody will understand, that does mean we need to take the time to make sure that what we produce will work for all of us. So it just takes a wee bit longer, but we're, we're, we're cracking on. Yeah, good. Thank you for that. And I think actually we've got Helen on the line now. So Helen calling us from Churchfell Housing Association. Hello, Helen. Yes, hello. Hi. Have you got a follow-on question to your text question? I'm just a bit concerned that if we don't get the workbook until the end of March, it doesn't really give us any kind of lead in time, really. Mm. Yeah, I understand. Any can we have a draft or something a bit earlier? <laughs> uh, I don't think we can put something out until we're confident that it's the definitive article. I think that would um, be probably even more confusing, but I do understand your concerns. What I'd say to you, Helen, is that you, you can continue to use the workbooks and all the materials you've got for the common induction standards. Yeah, and hello then, there. <laughs> and, and then transition across. Um, and, and as I say, um, we are... It was... Oh. I was just... I think we've got a bit of a cross line, so um, if you wouldn't mind, let's just hear the end of, of Sharon's point, which is it's okay to still use that as part of your transition plan. It, it absolutely and clearly is. there needs to be a transition plan if the materials are not available. Yes, and we have got um, tools already on our website that help you map um, what you're doing and what you will need to do. And I will take back uh, your concern to my colleagues who are working on this. And as soon as we're able to give a definitive answer on when the, the new works, workbooks will be available, I promise you we will get a message out on our website. OK, thanks for that, oh, Helen. Exactly. Thanks for your Thank text you. and your call. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. OK, bye. And we've got another caller on the line who is Peter from Green Tree Court. Hello, Peter. Hello. Hello, Peter. Hi. Hello. What, what's your question? Hello, Peter. I'm just trying to, to clarify the position with regard to sort of current employees. Uh, for example, um, our home recruits uh, generally ex fairly experienced care staff 
who have MVQ2 or MVQ3, but we still put them through the common induction standards mm. so that they, they work to the standards we expect in the home. Mm. Um, that will be still required to use the care certificate approach um, in that respect, in terms of them having to be a sector's competent when working, or can we still just continue to use the sort of common induction standards yeah. approach? Okay. Okay. That's a that's a great question, Peter. And again, if I can just reflect on my own experience, um, what what we used to do in the organisation where I was chief exec when we we brought new staff in, um, and and like you, some people were very new to care. Some people had worked in other services and came with what were then the the MVQs now the diplomas, um, and we used to do a learning needs assessment with them and check out whether we needed to do any additional induction. Uh, obviously, everybody needs the induction into the new organisation, but in relation to the standards, um, and then put the input in based on that individual learning needs assessment. But from April, any um, additional induction relevant to the standards will need to be to the care certificate. OK, that's great. Thanks for your call, Peter. Now, our phone lines are really hot, and we've got our next caller coming through, who's Heather from Spears House. Hello, Heather. Hello. What's your question for Sharon? Uh, my question is um, that I, I do understand the view that the manager should take responsibility for the certificate and assessing the staff, but I just wondered, does it have to physically be the manager? Can that be um, delegated to somebody else in mm. the organisation? Mm, that's a good, uh, that's question. a good question, Heather. Thanks very much for that. Um, and the answer is it can be delegated to somebody else and you may want to delegate it to somebody else within your organisation um, or you may want to delegate part of it to an external um, body or organisation. Uh -huh. I think the, the important thing is that um, ultimately you as manager will be signing that care certificate right. mm -hmm. so you need to assure yourself that whoever is undertaking the assessment you're confident that they are competent to do so. Right, now when we do sign the certificate, is it the certificate that uh, we submit information to yourselves or we get from yourself or we, where do we get this care certificate from? Yep. Okay, yeah, that's a, another great question. So the actual uh, paper certificate is available now on our website and you right. can download it. Okay. You can download it as a PDF or if you want to put your own organisational logo on that, you, you can do that within some guidelines that we've, we've produced. Um, but you will then complete the certificate with the name of the person who's completed mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. and obviously you sign it as the manager and, and on behalf of the organisation. That's Wonderful. great. So, yep, so Thank it's there on the website. Thanks, yep. Heather. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, we had a question uh, in a, a couple of questions in advance of the programme and our first question that came in is from Jennifer Dudley from Greensleeves. Will CQC inspectors be monitoring and confirming compliance with the care certificate? They certainly will. Um, CQC inspectors currently uh, look, look for evidence that people are uh, completing induction to the common induction standards. We've worked, as I said earlier, very closely with CQC on the development of the care certificate mm. and um, we work, Skills for Care works with CQC to ensure that their inspectors are skilled up and, and know what they, they're looking for. They're also part of our workforce so we need to look at their learning and development needs. Mm. But yes, they will be coming in and expecting to see evidence that every member of staff who started after the 1st of April has been signed off as competent to the standards in the care certificate. And that's the key phrase, isn't it? It's the expected induction exactly. that CQC are, are going to be looking for. That's absolutely right. OK, that's a good question. Thank you. And we've got another question now from Claire Poole from Optimum Workforce Leadership. The spirit of the care certificate is about real work situations, working with specific service users. So how will workers who have specific roles be able to gain the care certificate where their role does not include certain aspects, for example, such as in supported living? Mm. Here, workers will not necessarily be required to move and handle people. Will managers be able to exempt staff because it is not part of their role? Or will they have to do a secondment to gain evidence and that could act as a barrier to people mm. working in person-centred roles. Yeah, That's good okay, point. that is a great question. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, the, to, to gain the care certificate, staff will have to demonstrate that they are competent against all 15 standards. And again, in the development of the certificate, we had this debate a lot, you know, what if mm. we don't actually provide that kind of 
care and support, what if, I mean one of the other examples was we only work with adults, why do people need to understand child protection mm -hmm. um, and the answer to that one of course is that whether you work only with adults or not adults are part of families families have children we all need to understand what to do and it and it is um, the induction we're talking about here not kind of specialist knowledge but if you don't actually for your example um, need to support people with movement um, then what we've said is that you can assess through simulation and we will pro be providing guidance and examples of how you can do that to demonstrate because this is about demonstrating that somebody knows what they need to do and then can apply that in practice and that can be evidence yeah. through simulation. Because just because they don't need to do a particular part of the work today may not mean that they don't need to do it tomorrow. Absolutely, people's needs change yes. and, and we need yes. to be able to be flexible to respond to that. That's good, thank you. Now our phone lines are really busy but do please keep calling in on 0208 635 0030. There's still time to get your question on air today. In the meantime, we've had another question in earlier from Karen Walters from Friends of the Elderly. This is a question really about assessing the assessors. What do you think will satisfy CQC that those that are assessing the care certificate are actually occupationally competent? Mm -hmm. Do we need to be putting people through professional qualifications or is there something that, that Skills for Care might be planning to support and assess the people we will be using as assessors? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great question as well. Thank you for that. Um, I think the most important thing here is that the manager of the service needs to satisfy themselves that um, they have assessed everybody working in their service as being able to provide the quality of care and support that you aspire and, and want to see evidenced. So uh, there isn't a requirement for people to undertake a specific qualification. However, if you look at the um, guidance on our website for assessors, you will see in the back of that, we've given some examples of the sorts of, of knowledge, skills that a, a competent assessor needs to be able to evidence. If people want to undertake a formal qualification as part of their own learning and development, we would always encourage uh, ongoing learning and development mm. and achievement of qualifications, but it's not necessary. And um, our work supporting the CQC inspectors will ensure that they know what they're looking for um, and that they will be able to um, assess the ability of the assessor, because this is essentially about being a strong and effective manager. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And we had another question in earlier from Karen Cooper from Mount Ephraim House. My question is, when you have bank staff, it's not always possible to complete induction in the time frame. Where do we stand on that? And is there any leeway in the allowance that we have to complete induction for those members of staff? Mm, that's a good question, bank staff. Yes. Um, and I think one of the things to, to remind ourselves about, uh, why, why have we introduced this care certificate? What is this all about? It's all about ensuring that everybody working in your service, whether they're bank, whether they're full-time, whether they're part-time, is capable and knowledgeable, understands the what and the why and the how of what they need to do to provide high quality care. So if there are legitimate reasons why it might take somebody longer than mm. the, the 12 weeks that we um, suggest it should take uh, a member of staff to complete the common induction standards, and you can evidence why that is so, but that you do have a plan for them to complete and that, that um, you are uh, ensuring everybody working in the service works to those standards, I think that will be fine. Good, thank you for that. And we had a question in earlier from Dawn James from Cornwall Care. What I'd like to ask is, um, currently we claim workforce development funding against credited units from the QCF framework. With the QCF framework going to be disbanded this summer, I'm wondering whether skills of care are going to reallocate workforce development funds so that it's claimable against components of the care certificate. Okay, that's another great question. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the Workforce Development Fund, um, the Department of Health, who we disperse that fund on behalf of, um, and indeed Skills for Care's employer-led board, have been very clear that induction is the responsibility of the employer. Right. However, um, some of the units in the uh, care certificate and, and in the common induction standards as we are operating now, uh, map across to units within the level two and level three 
uh, diplomas. Mm -hmm. So where they do that, you can draw down funding, obviously, because you're working towards that qualification. Um, and in terms of the, the framework, it is the framework that's being disbanded. Um, and as we've talked about transition here, there will be a transition period to whatever is, is going to be moved to. We, we are all awaiting details and we will work with all, all relevant parties um, to ensure that we're able to both influence and keep our sector informed about that. Um, but the qualifications are trusted and valued by employers and the qualifications will stay and that's what we need to use the Workforce Development Fund, which is after all a, a, a limited pot of money yes. to encourage um, the driving up of levels of qualifications as far as we can in the sector. Okay. And um, while we're talking about um, assessment and qualification, could you talk about a little bit about the types of things that will be good evidence mm. um, when a manager is collecting evidence as assessment? Yes, okay, that's a great question as well. And there is guidance um, in, our, in our guides uh, already on the website and we'll produce further guidance if that's required. But I think people can really be quite creative and imaginative mm. about what mm. they provide as evidence. So it's not just about you know written uh, answers to questions, although that's a very useful way of yes. assessing, but a great way of getting feedback would be through asking uh, the people you're providing care and support to yeah. and carers mm. what do they think how do they um, interpret the way that somebody interacts with with them or with their family member um, are they satisfied that people are getting good nutritious food and that they, yes. they're getting drinks as and when they need them um, we could also look at um, things like uh, video blogs um, all sorts of different ways that people can um, can evidence their their um, their capability. I think what we what we won't accept is um, just a certificate saying somebody's right. attended a course or they've completed an e-learning, and that's because this is not only about the know-how to, but it's yeah. then applying that know-how yeah. to how you actually practice. Absolutely crucial. Mm. That's great advice. Thank you. Mm. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time today. Okay. If you didn't get your question answered, you can still contact Sharon directly through the Skills for Care website at www.skillsforcare.org.uk. And Sharon, before we go, I wonder if you could just perhaps give us a couple of summary messages from today's session that people can take away. OK, thanks, Sue. Um, I think I'd like to start by reiterating what I said at the beginning. The care certificate is a very important but part of that whole approach to leadership, learning and development. We've introduced it because we all know that it's critical to get the induction right. Uh, staff who have a good induction are more likely to stay with their employer, which has to be of benefit to all of us. Um, keep using the common induction standards until the end of March. The care certificate becomes the expected standard for new starters from the 1st of April, but there will be a proportionate approach to that transition yeah. um, between the two standards. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. If you want to watch this programme again, or if you know anyone who's missed the programme, then you can watch again from tomorrow morning. Simply log back into your online platform with your login and password, which will take you to the home page. Click on the programme tab, which will then take you to the video showreel and select the highlighted programme entitled Are You Ready for the Care Certificate? Simple. And good advice that in the short term, there's plenty of time to still keep using your common induction standard framework as the basis for your staff training and development. Of course, here at ACC, we will be updating our common induction standard materials in the coming months so that it fully recovers the requirements of the care certificate. You can get more information on the ACC Care Certificate materials and in fact on the full range of ACC programmes from us via our website at www.agedcarechannel.co.uk. Thank you again for joining us for this special live event today and until next time, goodbye.